Hello everyone, I'm Martin Jean. I'm director of the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University. We are an interdisciplinary graduate center for the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the related arts. And we are continuing our series once again of these uh, socially distant Zoom-inspired interviews, sharing the strengths and gifts of our faculty, colleagues, and friends around Yale. Uh, who uh, have something to speak to the present moment. And despite the uh, socially distant way in which we're doing this, we're determined uh, that uh, media is not the, the stumbling block here uh, for us to do our work. So I'm joined today by uh, a associate professor of Christian art and architecture at Yale Divinity School and the Institute of Sacred Music, Professor Vasilius Marinus whose uh, work in the Christian art and architecture of uh, the or Orthodox traditions has given him worldwide renown and fame. So very welcome to you, Professor Marinus. Hello, Martin. Nice to see you today. Uh, so Vasily, we, we all know that the majority of Christians celebrated Easter this year on April 12th, uh, but many of us uh, at this time of year forget that the second largest group of Christians in the world, the Orthodox or Chalcedonian Christians, celebrated it on April 19th, one week later. So can you remind us, first of all, of the historic reasons uh, that our calendars have, uh, have split in this way? Well, um, I'm not going to get into too many details because they are quite esoteric, and they speak to uh, the habit of uh, Christian denominations to um, disagree on a variety of things, including on how to calculate the day of Easter. But let me just say that uh, whereas uh, many uh, Chalcedonian Orthodox churches now follow the Gregorian calendar for the fixed um, uh, feast days, for example, Christmas, uh, they continue to use the Julian calendar in order to calculate the day of Easter. And that's why uh, often uh, we celebrate Easter at a different date than um, Roman Catholics or um, Protestant uh, denominations. So given the pivotal role, uh, Vasily, that visual imagery plays in the Christian East, is there in fact a central image or images that are germane to Orthodox Christians at Easter? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, throughout Holy Week, uh, we use a variety of uh, images. Um, icons might be also a familiar term to uh, some of our uh, audience. Uh, for Easter specifically, uh, we uh, focus on uh, the image of the resurrection or anastasis. And let me just uh, share my screen with you. And what you see here is actually not an icon, that is, it is not a wooden panel, but rather a mosaic, a um, image that is affixed on a wall, and it, uh, compri it's comprised of uh, small uh, cubes um, uh, made of um, uh, multicolored stone um, or colored glass um, uh, and so on. It's a, a, a work of exquisite uh, workmanship. Uh, and it's located in an 11th century church in Greece, in uh, the main church of the monastery of uh, Holy Luke. Holy Luke is a, a local saint. And it's a depiction of um, what we call the anastasis or the resurrection. Let me uh, walk you through um, the iconography here and the composition. Right at the center, you have a depiction of uh, Christ triumphant. With his right hand, he's holding a cross. And with his left hand, he's pulling from a very nice um, ancient-looking sarcophagus or uh, tomb uh, an elderly gentleman uh, who is identified with Adam. And next to Adam, you have a depiction of Eve. So you have the, the protoplast, the first two humans, uh, are being uh, resurrected with Christ. On Christ's right, you have uh, two uh, figures that are uh, dressed in uh, uh, imperial garments. Uh, the one on uh, the far left is uh, uh, David, and the one next to him is his son Solomon. And under Christ's feet, you can uh, perhaps uh, see a uh, kind of, um, of a hole or a cave. This is where we also find 
hardware of doors, uh, you know, leaves of doors, keys, locks, uh, uh, look in great disarray. The inspiration of this image comes from apocryphal literature, which very early on sought to explain what happened uh, in the three days that Christ was in the tomb. And according to these apocryphal texts, Christ went into Hades or the underworld and preached to the souls of the dead there. And on the third day, he uh, rose and emptied um, Hades. Now, before that happened, uh, and this is uh, quite an amusing part in these texts, uh, Satan and uh, personification of Hades uh, realize that something is going on, something is not quite right, and they want to uh, lock the doors of Hades so they can keep everybody in. Of course, this does not prohibit Christ from uh, raising uh, and that's why you have, uh, you know, the locks and the keys at uh, the bottom of, um, of uh, Christ's feet. You can see here that uh, this uh, image, uh, this composition is called uh, in Greek the Anastasis. This translates as the resurrection. And it is, of course, the resurrection of Christ. But we can also interpret it as the resurrection of Adam and Eve. And the fact that Adam and Eve, the prototypical humans, the first humans, are there conveys the message that Christ's resurrection makes resurrection available to all. It doesn't make heaven available to all, but it makes resurrection available to um, all. Uh, my students often ask me uh, why uh, uh, we have uh, Solomon and um, uh, David uh, on uh, the other side of Christ. And um, this is not as uh, easy to understand and interpret. We know that uh, David is a prophet and, uh, but, uh, and, and the uh, composer of the Psalms, according to the tradition. But he's uh, also the royal ancestor of Christ. And the presence of Solomon next to David uh, draws attention to uh, Christ's Davidic ancestry. And, uh, it's an allusion essentially to uh, Christ's human nature, right? So we have a depiction of uh, Christ's divinity as he raises this uh, way triumphantly from the dead, uh, but also an emphasis on his um, uh, human nature as well. Uh, Vasily, is there anything uh, sui generis in this image to, uh, to Eastern Christianity per se? Something here that we wouldn't find so much in the so-called West. Well, uh, both Eastern and Western Christians uh, celebrate uh, Christ's resurrection. Um, and um, I'm going to state here or repeat rather uh, an oversimplification that Western Christians um, emphasize Christ's passion during Holy Week, whether, whereas uh, Eastern Christians focus more on the Anastasis. This is, um, again, an, an oversimplification, but there is a seed of truth. Um, and um, we see that even uh, um, during Holy Week, on Holy Friday, for example, Almost in the middle of the service on Holy Friday um, uh, evening, we see a change in the tone of singing. And the singing from being uh, very somber, uh, very solemn, uh, suddenly becomes very joyous, as if there isn't really uh, a reason or time to mourn Christ's death, but rather it's time already to look forward to uh, the resurrection. And, the, you know, just the, the, fa the fact that this image is adorned in such a way uh, with gold embedded in it so profusely and the beautiful um, elaborate uh, borders that they've uh, wrought here, even the way that these old stylized coffins are depicted, um, says to me that this is, uh, this is not just an image that's trotted out uh, once a year, but rather an image that has been, uh, where there's been considerable care um, to, uh, to depict it, and that is there all year round. Is that true? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, the uh, celebration of the liturgy is, according to several commentators, a reenactment of Christ's salvific, salvific uh, work on earth, uh, including, of course, the pinnacle of uh, Christ's salvific work, which is uh, the resurrection. And I also wanted to mention that, uh, especially in this uh, monument, this uh, uh, very lush golden uh, backgrounds. And here we are talking really about gold leaf sandwiched uh, between uh, layers of glass. Uh, give uh, these images an otherworldly quality. Yeah. Uh, they, it's an indication that this is not really a depiction of a historical event, or it is not only that, but it is uh, something that happens again and again in um, uh, throughout um, uh, the church, uh, throughout the church year. This is an image that you know well for a number of reasons, right? I mean, you you grew up in a in a town not very far from Osias Lucas, and so you you got to know the not only the the content of this image but where it's positioned in the church. And could you say something about that? Yes, this image is positioned in uh, um, the narthex of uh, the main church in the monastery of Josius Lucas, and it's part of a um, small passion cycle. Uh, we have a depiction also of um, uh, the washing of the feet, uh, Christ's crucifixion, and uh, next to this one, the doubting of um, uh, Thomas. These images uh, acquire uh, different meaning when lived um, or when, when seen uh, during um, uh, Holy Week and during the uh, celebrations mm -hmm. and the services of uh, Holy Week. And uh, I should also mention that, uh, you know, the photograph that you see on the screen uh, was taken uh, by a camera and it's uniformly uh, lit um, so we can see it and appreciate it. But in its in original context, <clears throat> even though the church has a lot of natural light, um, especially during the night, it wouldn't have been that visible. But uh, the properties of the mosaic, you put artificial light on them, for example, candles or lamps, they reflect the light in a way that um, the image almost becomes alive. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you need to imagine you know, the experience of the people worshiping in this space um, at darkness, at lamplight, um, while holding candles, and how all these figures are not you know, fixed and static, but um, rather you know, moving. Christ is leaping from yeah. Hades and dragging um, um, Adam with him. Um, it's, almost, it's quite impressive. Almost kind of a cinematic quality to it, isn't there? Uh, especially by candlelight. I, I, I know this from having visited uh, this very place. Absolutely, and that's why it is important uh, to uh, not only teach um, with slides and PowerPoints, but uh, also to visit as much as possible these monuments because this you know, phenomenolo phenomenological approach um, alters uh, quite significantly the way uh, we understand them. Yeah, um, I'm appreciating, especially especially in in this uh, pandemic time in which we're speaking, that uh, this word of resurrection and hope uh, is uh, a prominent one in in uh, your tradition, not only once a year, but in fact the entire year. And that's uh, something that I can easily take with me in these coming weeks. So thank you, uh, Vasily, for the time today. And thank you all for tuning in. You can watch others, others of these uh, interviews and more to come on our website, ism.yale.edu, and follow us also on our social media platforms. Thank you for today, and thank you, Vasily. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. Meanwhile, stay well and healthy, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin.